Hello, everyone. I'm James Payton. I'm a health journalist at Bloomberg News in London, and uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Nkengasong, director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He has decades of experience in public health battling viruses, including HIV, and has played a pivotal role in Africa's response to COVID-19. Now, two years into the pandemic, vaccine supplies are finally picking up. Manufacturing projects are underway to reduce Africa's reliance on the rest of the world. Um, but only 10% of its population is vaccinated today. Distribution challenges are threatening to slow rollouts. Uh, a rush for boosters could further widen inequalities and um, future variants, of course, remain a big risk. Um, now, doctor, I wanted to start with uh, Omicron and uh, the question of whether we are approaching a turning point in 2022. Officials, uh, as you know, in some countries are uh, keen to start thinking about COVID as an endemic disease, living with the virus. Um, what's your response to that in Africa where most people are still unvaccinated? I think uh, thinking of Omicron and COVID-19 in general in terms of an endemic disease in Africa is, is going to be um, a, a, a reality if we do not vaccinate at speed and at scale in 2022. Uh, what we must do uh, to get the continent to where it has to be, which is to uh, vaccinate at least 70% of its population by the end of 2022, is to work more collaboratively, more cooperatively, and in more in solidarity to get us to the, where we have to be. Uh, as we speak, as you rightly said earlier, 10% of the continent has been fully vaccinated. And it will be an obvious task to get to 70%. But until, and unless we get to that level, uh, the continent has an unpredictable and uncertain trajectory for this pandemic. Now, in, in thinking about vaccines, uh, you know, those doses are starting to flow. The focus is shifting to getting those shots into arms now. Um, but donations are arriving, you know, with short shelf lives and little notice. Um, how has that hindered the rollout uh, in Africa? And what do you see as the biggest uh, challenge now in, in boosting vaccination rates? So let's start with the good news. The good news is that we are beginning to see a shift where vaccines, uh, many more vaccines are arriving in the continent uh, through several avenues. Uh, the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team, commonly called AVAP, that is coordinated by uh, Mr. Strive Masihi, uh, created by President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa when he was the chair of the African Union. Uh, the COVAX mechanism, uh, COVAX just celebrated a uh, one billion dose donation uh, uh, this week. And of course, bilateral donations like those coming from the US CDC, uh, 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 the US government, I beg your pardon, and others across the world. So that is the good news that we are seeing now. Now, the challenge we have uh, on our hands is how do we translate this arrivals of vaccines into the arms of people and get us from where we are to about uh, 70%. That is really going to be the challenge and the way we should focus in 2022. It is doable. African countries have shown that if enabled and supported, they can truly scale up vaccination. Look at what is happening in Rwanda. Uh, look at what is happening in, in uh, Morocco and Seychelles, Mauritius. So it's doable if we apply our minds to it and we should apply our minds to it in a more deliberate fashion in 2022. And I wanted to follow up on donations as well, because there was some AirFindy data last week that showed uh, about 240 million doses purchased by wealthy countries uh, are set to expire in March before they can be used. That number could rise much higher. What is your reaction to that waste, uh, given so many people in the world uh, are unprotected today? No, uh, the, my message to the world has always been that we are in this together. And a threat anywhere, especially in Africa, a continent of 1.2 billion people will continue to be a threat all over the world. And we've seen that with the Omicron. 
uh, we should really apply our minds, as I said earlier, to uh, ways to, we can coordinate our efforts so that those kind of amounts of vaccines are evenly distributed and do that quickly. I mean, the, the, a pattern we have seen on the continent and where we have, as Africa CDC, work closely with other partners to issue a statement on is the short delivery. Okay, if you deliver vaccines and they arrive within four weeks or so time frame, it's a very high possibility that those vaccines would not be used. And then the narrative will be that Africans have not used those vaccines, which is not uh, really accurate. So I think a coordinated approach, a more collaborative approach will be uh, extremely uh, important. And that is why we salute the efforts of uh, countries that are making large donations to the, the, the continent, uh, uh, as I indicated earlier. And, and I want to get your thoughts on manufacturing as well. There are you know, numerous efforts underway across Africa. Uh, you know, companies like BioNTech and Moderna have pointed to various plans. What is it going to take to ensure that those promises are, are kept? And what do you see as the main obstacle that needs to be overcome to uh, making Africa more self-sufficient when it comes to vaccine uh, manufacturing capacity? No, wonderful. That is a great question. I think we are seeing uh, several uh, things happening on the continent, all very positive. If you recall, um, in April of last year, the Africa CDC hosted a summit on vaccine manufacturing in Africa, where about 40,000 participants took part in at that summit, including several head of states. And um, we, we are very delighted to see that there's been a large movement uh, for, from the countries uh, in Africa to engage in the process of vaccine manufacturing, including Rwanda, Senegal, South Africa, Morocco, Algeria, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, just to name uh, a, a few. I think um, I was in Senegal just a few weeks ago and actually was moved to have been at, uh, standing at the, the, the foundation of where they were building a massive uh, vaccine manufacturing complex uh, I've been to South Africa, we've been to Egypt to see this, I've been to Rwanda. So it's really amazing to see the tremendous movement that is happening there. So, but what do we need? We need partnerships. We need partnership with um, more advanced countries to support these efforts. And that is why we launched the Partnership for African Vaccine Manufacturing, uh, abbreviated PAVM, which, ha which has become a framework uh, that is governizing the manufacturing of vaccines on the continent. So I think that is one set of problems which means we need human capital. We, at, at the same time, we need financial capital and the, the ability to shape the market. Remember, you cannot go into any production of vaccines in any meaningful way if there, there is no market for that. We really have to ensure that uh, if vaccines are produced on the continent, they are actually used or they are purchased and used on the continent and possibly exported. So I think that is, uh, those are the kind of the equations that we have to balance between the demand side of it and the supply side of uh, the vaccine manufacturing. And I mentioned the, the companies, uh, you know, there's been obviously a big push to get uh, pharma companies uh, to share patents and technology. You know, do you see any chance of the drug makers, uh, you know, getting on board with that? What's your message to the to the vaccine manufacturers and the big companies, uh, you know, that say that um, sharing intellectual property isn't the answer to to the access gap? Um, do you see any uh, foresee any changes on that front? I think we continue to be encouraged by uh, the movement in that front. I mean, the United States, for example, has supported. Uh, 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 very clearly uh, a move towards intellectual property uh, 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 and sharing and in, uh, transfer of technology. We, ha we know that other countries in Europe have not necessarily taken that position, but we believe that it is uh, a matter of dialogue and a matter of time that everyone sees that it is for our collective interest to share that uh, information, share that knowledge and transfer technology so that you have a strong regional commitment to manufacturing. A strong manufacturing capabilities on the continent of Africa will increase our global health security capabilities and capacities. I think uh, it is not just for the interest of the African continent alone, but it's for the collective interest to have such manufacturing happening on the continent. So again, we should actually evolve also to co-creation of intellectual property, not just transfer of intellectual property, you know, such that uh, if we enable vaccine manufacturing hubs on the continent, 
uh, they can actually bring together young talented experts across the continent that will produce uh, gen and generate knowledge be innovative and create technologies that will help in vaccine manufacturing not just for covid but for other uh, uh, diseases that challenge the continent and and you know there's a focus on vaccines for for good reason um, but what about covid therapies you said last week that the africa cdc uh, is in talks with Pfizer about importing their COVID pill. Are you, you know, close to an announcement um, on that? How soon do you hope to uh, secure antivirals for Africa? No, absolutely. In the next uh, couple of months, that is essentially in 2022, there are three things that the continent must focus on to continue to combat uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. One is act increased access and to diagnostics, uh, decentralize it so that uh, the rapid antigen tests can actually be used at community level. Uh, the more people test, the more people can take responsibility, isolate themselves, uh, and then uh, break down the, the chain of transmission. That is very important. Uh, second, of course, we discussed earlier is scaling up vaccination across the continent. But third and very importantly is the access to treatment, the new drugs that are available. Paxlovy is a good example. And we are in discussions, as you said, with, um, with Pfizer. We hope and remain very optimistic that in the coming uh, month, uh, hopefully by the end of next month, we will be uh, uh, in very close to making an announcement. And um, why is that important? Because if we look at um, the, 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 the Omicron, for example, the outbreak of the Omicron, we realize that if this virus had led to a scenario where the hospital systems will be overwhelmed, uh, uh, then we would have been in a very challenging position. But if you have such drugs, people can actually test and treat themselves at home and not overwhelm the, the, the health system. That is why treatment is so important and we'll continue to engage in that. But I remain very optimistic that in the coming weeks, we should be able to make an announcement uh, uh, with respect to the partnership with Pfizer. Okay, that's interesting. And to what extent could the lack of testing in Africa limit the, the you know, the advantages, the upside of some of these antivirals? Um, you know, we've seen a lot of cases obviously are not being detected in Africa. There are efforts underway to scale up, you know, testing across the continent. I mean, to what extent is that a worry for you right now? It is an, it clearly a public health concern that we have to uh, continue to join uh, forces and efforts to scale up testing because uh, as we've learned in HIV AIDS, if you uh, uh, test uh, at scale, you identify the, the infected or affected individuals and then road bring them into treatment, especially if the treatment becomes widely available. So testing and treatment will go hand in hand once the, test, the, the treatment becomes available. So we will do everything possible. But again, in partnership, there's none of these that uh, Africa will do on its own. We will need to continue to work in very close partnership because it's a global problem. It requires a global solution. Okay. And I also wanted to talk about, you know, just some of the indirect costs of, of COVID-19. You know, the, the pandemic is threatening to divert resources from other diseases. Uh, you know, to what extent have the campaigns to tackle TB, malaria, routine immunizations, uh, across the continent uh, and other priorities. Um, uh, to what extent have those been affected and how do you look at the, uh, the long-term risk of dealing with COVID on top of HIV? Uh, it is clearly evidence that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has created massive disruption uh, to other um, endemic diseases or call it pandemics. HIV is a pandemic on the continent. And uh, there's been a lot of disruption. The Global Fund has actually uh, clearly indicated how much disruption has occurred in the ability to deliver HIV services and treatment uh, for uh, uh, because of, of COVID. I think many more deaths are happening, not necessarily because of COVID, but due to the disruption that COVID uh, has brought to bear on the health system. There. That is true also for tuberculosis and malaria programs. So, we have to look at that in a more comprehensive way. And that is the, 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 one of those harms that uh, you expect uh, a, a disruptive pandemic like uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, to bring to the health system. And that is why treatment is so important. That is why vaccination is so important. And that's why testing at scale is also very, very important. We'll continue to see that 
If we do not bring this under control, that is uh, vaccinate at scale and at speed, you continue to see in 2022 much more disruptions um, and deviation of our healthcare workers to uh, 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 devoting their attention more on COVID than other diseases that are out there killing um, many, many uh, uh, Africans. So we really need a comprehensive approach to respond to, to COVID in 2022. Uh, that the way to mitigate the harm on other challenges is to really focus and break the backbone of this pandemic in 2022. And people, and with COVID, uh, returning to COVID for a second, people look at the statistics on the cases and the deaths, which suggest the continent hasn't been um, nearly as hard hit as uh, a number of wealthy nations, but we've seen estimates showing, say, one in 80 cases in Uganda, you know, are being detected. The excess mortality in South Africa uh, is very high. It depends on the country, but, you know, to what extent are the costs uh, and, you know, effects of COVID being uh, overlooked um, across the continent? I think the if you test for and count for any disease, um, you, you tend to miss, not count everything. I think it's true, not just for Africa, but all, all over the world. I think the clear, what you are seeing in Africa is a reflection of the weak health system that uh, uh, have always been there. I, I have argued that you do not fix your health systems in the middle of a pandemic, you fix them before a pandemic. Uh, just like you don't um, dig your words when you are testy, you, you actually have to have your words uh, ready before you are tested. So I think the lesson number one we are learning from this is that we have to, as a continent, be very deliberate in investing in our health systems. And that's why we've called for a new public health order for the continent. A new public health order that says that we must invest in our manufacturing of our health security commodities, i.e. diagnostics, pharmaceuticals, uh, personal protective equipment, and vaccines. Uh, our workforce, a competent workforce development, our ability to strengthen our national public health institutions, partnership with the private sector and, and other sectors are very key components of this new public health order. So that is what, if we do this, then we'll be able to actually in future pandemic be able to document exactly what is going on uh, in terms of the prevalence of the unboarding of the disease and the mortality rate. But for now, we are struggling because you know, of the weak health systems in surveillance in testing that characterize the continent and has characterized the continent for, for so long. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned future uh, pandemics because I wanted to look ahead uh, and get your thoughts um, on uh, you know, planning for the next uh, emergencies. This won't be the last pandemic. Um, how will Africa be positioned, do you think, coming um, out of this crisis to be able to respond to the next one? And what is the main thing that you think needs to change uh, to strengthen Africa's health defenses now? So as I just said uh, earlier, there's, um, the, the only way the continent will position itself to be better prepared for the next pandemic is really to implement the, the, the elements that I align in the new public health order, that is our vaccine manufacturing, diagnostics. Remember when this pandemic started in 2019, uh, uh, by January of 2020, there was no country in Africa that had the reagents to test for COVID. Okay, it is only in February that we started uh, training programs in Senegal and subsequently in South Africa to enable countries to have the ability to test. I think um, that situation has to change. And I'm very optimistic though, that uh, with what we are seeing now, with Senegal producing uh, rapid antigen tests and South Africa, with Morocco producing the PCR tests, with about nine or 10 countries engaged in the journey for vaccine manufacturing, how we fight the next pandemic will be very different from what we are currently, uh, uh, the, the, the methods and the capabilities and capacities on, on which we are using to fight the current pandemic there. But we must embrace that new public health order to better prepare ourselves to fight the next pandemic. And in our closing uh, seconds, tell us about your next steps. President Biden announced his plan in September to nominate you as ambassador at large, coordinator of US activities to combat uh, HIV. What are your next steps? Well, I think that, as you know, this is uh, it's, it's the nomination and I'm very grateful uh, to the president, President Biden, for that nomination. 
uh, uh, remember it still has to go through uh, a Senate confirmation and um, we will um, have no more, I'm sure, subsequently once we are through with the Senate confirmation. Dr. Nkengasong, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was great speaking with you and hope to uh, uh, chat with you again at some point soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity.